My name is Ken Ruscio, and I'm, uh, I have the privilege this year of uh, chairing the AAC and U Board during a, a very special time. It's our centennial. I also have the privilege of uh, serving as president of one of the nation's oldest universities, Washington and Lee University. And it provides for me a number of examples in my capacity as president of one of these old universities to call upon stories from our time in the past. In 1839, for example, one of my predecessors, Henry Ruffner, published a novel entitled Judith Ben Sadi. 1839 was a different time for college presidents. They could actually publish novels. <laughs> one passage uh, describes a group of students who hiked House Mountain, a local landmark visible on the horizon from almost any point on our campus. The mountain, in the words of the novel, hides the setting sun and not infrequently turns the summer showers that come from the west wind. It stands like an island of the air with its huge body and sharp angles to cut the current of the winds asunder. From their perch atop the mountain, the students look down upon the little homesteads that spotted the hills and valleys under the mountains the large farms and country seats farther away, and the bright group of buildings in the village of Lexington. It was a vista, in the words of the novel, that relieved the mind from the painful sublimity of the distant prospect and prepared us, after hours of delightful contemplation, to descend from our aerial height and return with gratified feelings to our college and our studies again. Well, that struck me as an interesting metaphor for our work here over the next couple of days for two reasons. One is that a centennial, in some respects, is a kind of arbitrary date. It's, a, you know, it's not all that different from our 99th year. It's not all that different from our 101st year. But it is an occasion, a time for reflection, a time to look back and think about things, how higher education was, in 1915, how it is today, and to get that different perspective, that different angle that comes from occasionally stepping back from our day-to-day -day routine and gazing down upon the vista that is higher education. Higher education today is a lot different than it was in 1915. Our student bodies are more diverse, our institutions are more diverse, public policy is a lot different, the role of the economy and higher education is a lot different, and the role of democracy and higher education, that relationship is much different. And we can only imagine what our, our successors will be saying 100 years from now in 2115 as they unearth the archives of our discussions here in 2015 and look back at the changes that higher education has for the future. And that really is the second reason why I think the metaphor of the mountain is so apt. Because the students at the end of their time came down from the mountain and began their studies again. And really the task of the next few days is much more about what lies ahead and how we can achieve what we want to achieve. It's a couple of days of action as well as reflection and probably more action than reflection. So we have a lot of work to do and we want to get right to it. I um, want to do a few housekeeping things before we get right to the, the business at hand. And let me start with a few thanks. First, we want to acknowledge this morning those individuals who are attending the Centennial Annual Meeting from ACNU's founding member institutions. We welcome and honor those here from our founding members. They were not actually there at the founding, but the institutions were. The blue ribbons on the name badges note the founding members, and I hope you'll join me in expressing our thanks to those institutions who were there at the very beginning and remain with us today. We also thank ta uh, Task uh, Stream for being the featured sponsor of the 2015 annual meeting. Task Stream is a comprehensive planning, assessment, and analytics company that provides cloud-based software and support to higher education. You can visit them at the sponsor table on level four, 
and we deeply appreciate their generous support of the conference. Thanks also to the 21 other companies and organizations that are sponsors of this meeting. And a final thanks for me, although not the last thanks I think that you'll hear um, over the next couple of days, to the AAC and U staff. They're the ones who don't look 100 but feel 100. They, are, <laughs> they have uh, been working very, very hard. All of you who are familiar with these kinds of things know the work that goes on behind the scenes for various reasons not necessary to go into this morning. Uh, this particular meeting, not just because it was a centennial, but for other reasons, uh, provided uh, great challenges to the staff. And um, it's a credit to them that you don't know that. And, and you can just go about your business over the next few days. So please join me in thanking them as well for their efforts. AAC and U enjoys a very good relationship with the American Conference of Academic Deans. And Mark Roy, who is the provost of Goucher College um, and chair of that association, um, will offer some uh, welcoming remarks. He also serves on the board of AAC and U. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the American Conference of Academic Deans, ACAD, I am very pleased to welcome you to this annual joint meeting of AACNU and ACAD. Uh, as was just mentioned, I do have the honor and the privilege of serving on both boards and uh, currently the chair of the board of ACAD, an incredible organization that is designed to support the professional development of deans, provosts, and other academic leaders. AACNU has been a leading advocate and a leader for liberal education for 100 years, as was just noted, marking the centennial as a momentous occasion, and I offer my deep congratulations on behalf of ACAD to President Carol Geary Schneider and her staff for their outstanding work. I would not be standing here if it were not for AAC and U. ACAD was founded in the mid-1940s. At that time, the predecessor of today's AAC and U uh, was an organization of college and university presidents. They had the vision and the foresight to see the value of a partner organization for deans and provosts. To this day, AAC and U and ACAD remain partners with a close affiliation and a shared commitment to the values of liberal education. In addition to this annual meeting, we collaborate on other ventures, and ACAD is deeply grateful for AAC and U support, which has been instrumental in our success. I also want to briefly note that ACAD shares a special relationship with Phi Beta Kappa Society on Friday, and on Friday evening, um, our organizations will host a reception to which you are all welcome. And of course, you're all welcome to attend the ACAD sessions uh, throughout the conference. ACAD exists to serve its members, more than 700 individuals, leading the academic enterprise in their colleges and universities. Being a dean or an academic officer involves a tremendous amount of learning, often at a dizzying pace, with one foot, pla uh, one foot planted firmly in the administration and often the other in the faculty. And yet on many campuses there are at best a few and often no other academic officers to contribute to that learning. And that can be a lonely and difficult job. ACAD exists to fill that gap and we strive to meet the needs of our members, providing opportunities for fellowship and interactive learning and a community of students of the discipline of academic leadership. In addition to our annual meeting, we maintain a very active listserv and we publish the resource handbook for academic deans, which is available at the ACAD uh, table two levels down. Again, I want to thank you all for being with us for this meeting. I hope that you leave refreshed and encouraged with valuable ideas to take home to, for the benefits of our faculties and especially for our students. And again, congratulations to AAC and you.
Thank you, Mark, and thank you, ACAD, as well. Um, in keeping with the theme of looking to the future as much as reflecting on the past, it's my distinct pleasure now to introduce the recipients of the K. Patricia Cross Future Leaders Award. The K. Patricia Cross Future Leaders Award recognizes graduate students who are committed to developing academic and civic responsibility in, the, in themselves and others, and who show exemplary promise as future leaders of higher education. The award also honors Dr. Cross, Professor Emerita of Higher Education at the University of California, Berkeley. Since 2005, AACNU has been pleased to host this prestigious award, and we are proud to present this year's recipients, who were selected from a pool of 270 individuals nominated by faculty and administrators from their campuses. I'll ask uh, each of them to stand as their name is called and also ask all of you to please hold your applause until all 10 are announced. Anya Adair, English Literature and Language from Yale University. Rebecca Christensen, Higher Education, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. And please remain standing. <laughs> Neil Connor, Geography, University of Tennessee. Victoria Hortensia Febra, Visual Arts, Stony Brook University. Carolyn Fisher, Biochemistry, Cornell University. Jacob Gross, Educational Psychology, Virginia Tech. Rebecca Lee, Developmental Biology, University of California, Irvine. Hannah Miller, Teacher Education, Michigan State University. Nagme Nazare Morlock, Sociology, University of Colorado Boulder. Erin Marie Rentschler, English, Duquesne University. Please join me in congratulating these. Thank you. And we look forward to them being up here in 2115. <laughs> One of you will figure it out. <laughs> I'm so pleased to introduce to you Eric Liu and Carol Gar Gary Schneider, who will deliver our opening plenary remarks in just a minute. And it will be a very, very fitting kickoff to this conference. I'm going to introduce both of them, and then they'll come up here successively. And they have a lot in store. We'll see if there's any time left for questions at the end. But I will let the program proceed, and we'll see where it goes. Eric Liu is an author, educator, and civic entrepreneur. He is the founder and CEO of Citizen University, which promotes and teaches the art of great citizenship through a portfolio of national programs. His books include the national bestseller, The Gardens of Democracy, co-authored with Nick Hanauer. Eric also co-authored The True Patriot with Hanauer, and together the two have created the True Patriot Network to advance the book's ideals of progressive patriotism. His book, The Accidental Asian, Notes of a Native Speaker, was a New York Times notable book featured in the PBS documentary, Matters of Race. Eric served as a White House speechwriter for President Bill Clinton and later as the President's Deputy Domestic Policy Advisor. He served as an executive at the digital media company Real Networks, and in 2002, he was named one of the World, World Economic Forum's Global Leaders of Tomorrow. In 2010, he was awarded the Bill Grace Leadership Legacy Award by the Center for Ethical Leadership. Eric lives in Seattle, where he teaches civic leadership at the University of Washington and hosts an acclaimed television interview program called Seattle Voices. In addition to speaking regularly at venues across the country, he serves on numerous nonprofit and civic boards and is a regular columnist for CNN and a correspondent for the, correspondent for the Atlantic.com. He's a graduate of Yale and Harvard Law School and most importantly, serves on the LEAP National Leadership Council. 
Eric's remarks will be followed by AACNU's uh, president, Carol Schneider. Carol has served as AACNU's president since 1998. Under her leadership, AACNU has launched Liberal Education in America's Promise, LEAP, a public advocacy and campus action initiative designed to engage students and the public with what really matters in a college education for the 21st century. The LEAP campaign builds on AACNU's major effort, Greater Expectations, the commitment to quality as the nation goes to college, a multi-year initiative designed to articulate, articulate the aims of a 21st century liberal education and to identify comprehensive, innovative models that improve learning for all undergraduate students. Additionally, under Carroll's leadership, ACNU has become widely recognized as both a voice and force for strengthening the quality of student learning in college for all students, and especially those historically underserved in U.S. higher education. ACNU, as you know, is working with hundreds of colleges and universities in numerous state systems to expand the benefits of liberal education across the entire curriculum through new integration between the core outlines of liberal education and student learning in their major fields. While a vice president at ACNU in the 1990s, Carol headed a major initiative on higher education and U.S. pluralism, American commitments, diversity, democracy, and liberal learning. She has published extensively on all the major areas of her educational work and has taught at the University of Chicago, DePaul, Chicago State University, and Boston University. Carol's a graduate of Mount Holyoke and Harvard. She also received 11 honorary degrees, was the 2011 recipient of ACPA's Contribution to Higher Education Award, and the 2000 recipient of the Ernest L. Boyer Award, and was honored in 2013 as one of Diverse Magazine's 25 leading women in higher education. Please join me in welcoming both of these outstanding individuals. Good morning. Thank you very much, Ken, for that introduction. And uh, I just uh, am thrilled to be here this morning and uh, to be in this wonderful space with all of you. I had a chance to come in a little bit uh, last evening and catch some of the uh, conversation. And uh, it's uh, already just so palpable, the electricity, the sense of uh, purpose uh, that you have here in this gathering. And I think it's not just, as Ken says, that it's the, ha the, the, the randomly round number of 100, uh, but I think it has something to do with the moment and it has something to do with the leadership uh, of this organization. I really, uh, before I dive into any of my remarks, just want to truly acknowledge uh, the leadership and the vision uh, that Carol has brought to this organization and her entire team. When you think about this being a 100-year organization, and you've been uh, president for 17 of those years, you see the ways in which a sense of vision, a sense of purpose about pluralism, about diversity, about the ways that liberal education and democracy are entwined um, end up being not just jargon, not just words uh, on paper, on slogans, but they end up getting woven into the very fabric of this institution uh, in everything that it does, in every convening uh, that it organizes, in every initiative that it launches. I've had the great opportunity serving not only on the LEAP uh, National Leadership Council, but also on the <clears throat> task force that helped uh, put together several years ago the, uh, the report, uh, A Crucible Moment, uh, that this organization put out in cooperation with uh, the Obama administration and others, and uh, making this case that we all believe in here uh, internally, making it externally uh, to a wider world and to policymakers. And uh, again, you think about moments like that, uh, and that is an expression uh, of the vision and the passion and the leadership that Carol has brought to this organization. So thank you, Carol. Uh, I uh, am just very excited to spend some time with you here this morning. I, I think, you know, the, the phrase, a crucible moment, is uh, rather apt. We, uh, we gather here not only reflecting on the state of this profession, not only here to contemplate the meaning and the purpose of liberal education and a democracy, but really to focus, I think, on three questions that I'd like to spend a little bit of time 
chewing on this morning. The first one is simple. Who is us? Who is us? When we talk about ourselves as Americans, when we talk about ourselves as members of the American Association of Colleges and Universities, what do we mean? What are we talking about? How is that something more than just an adjective thrown around? How is that a vessel of cultural and civic and educational and purposeful content? Who is us? The second question, of course, is very much at the heart of AAC and you, and that is, what is liberal education for? Again, <clears throat> I think almost everybody here in their sleep could give some answer to that and spends a lot of time talking to people outside of the quarters of higher education making the case for liberal education, but it is worth our while as we gather here for the centennial meeting just to put that question squarely on the table. What is this for? The purpose of liberal education. And finally, the third question, which is quite urgent on my mind in the work that I do at Citizen University, is simply this. Is democracy done? Is democracy done? And I want to unpack each of these questions a little bit uh, and then really reflect on how I think they all fold into the work and the mission of the next hundred years of this organization. Who is us? You know, we're gathering today at a moment of incredible demographic change. We're rapidly approaching a date. Some people say it's 2040, some say it's 2042, when uh, I won't even use the phrase, it's kind of an oxymoron, majority-minority. Uh, we will be a majority people of color country. That day is rapidly approaching. It's a period of flux, though, not only in the statistics that are counted by the census, it's a period of flux also in thinking about the very notion of how nations forge identities. If you look around the world, outside the borders of the United States, all across Asia and Europe, there's a resurgence of nationalism. There's a resurgence of ethnic and religious fundamentalism. There's a resurgence of a belief that purity is possible. Ideological purity, ethnic purity, bloodline purity, that purity is possible. And that, to put it another way, that people should not rest until purity is achieved. And that I think of as a virus, that idea, that mindset. That virus is circling the globe many times over right now. And the globe's immune system, our capacity to resist that virus, is weak right now. It's weak in East Asia, Asia, where Japan and China and Korea and other nations are rediscovering ancient animosities. It's weak in Europe. And not just because we, we gather here today in the wake of Charlie Hebdo and Je suis Charlie and all of the you know, virulent and violent threats to free speech, but even as you think about what's going on peacefully in Germany, across Western Europe now, anti-immigration marches, people gathering and making their voices heard as citizens, yes, but gathering to say, we want to redeem a dream of purity of our folk, of our people. There is too much impurity in our midst. There are too many people who don't look like us, who don't pray like us, who don't think like us, who don't talk like us. And it's disgusting. That virus is circling the planet right now. And we look at ourselves in the United States, and this isn't exactly a moment of high self-congratulation. You know, I think it's not just the centennial of the American Association of Colleges and Universities. It is the half-centennial this year of the Voting Rights Act. It is the half-centennial plus one of the Civil Rights Act. It is essentially the half-centennial of the Civil Rights Movement. And the fact that we are in this moment here still thinking not only about all the ways in which the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, or the Fair Housing Act of 1965 are getting in different ways eroded and undermined and perhaps, if you think about it differently, repurposed, whether voluntarily or not. You think about that, you think, well, it would be fine if all we were having are 
legitimate policy debates about how to refresh and update these landmark pieces of legislation. But that's not all that's going on in this country right now. The fact that the fact that there exists a hashtag on social media that says Black Lives Matter kind of says it all to me. The fact that that has to be said in the year 2015. The fact that it has to be stated that in political life, in the criminal justice system, in the education system, whether K-12 or higher education, in our communities, in the world of arts and culture, that it has to be said that black lives, black voices, black identities, black stories should be treated as fully American lives and stories and voices and identities. To me, the fact that that has to be said says that we've got at least another half century to go to deliver on the promises not only of Dr. King, but the promises of AACNU and the promises indeed of the founders and the framers of this country. We've got a long way to go. One of the things that I'm very conscious of as an Asian American and as a Chinese American in particular, indeed this is the subject of a very recent book of mine called A Chinaman's Chance, about being Chinese American in this age of China and America and increasingly this age of China versus America. I'm very conscious of the ways in which people who look like me Still, in 2015, not in a room like this, but even when I leave a room like this, when I go up to the lobby, when I walk around a town like this, when I turn on the media and think about the stories and the ideas that are being generated by people in the Beltway here in D.C., I realize that people who look like me often labor under presumption. And that presumption is presumed foreign until proven otherwise. Presumed alien until proven citizen. Who is us? One of the things that I, makes me, I, I suppose, not quite optimistic about this rapidly approaching date in 2040 when we are a majority people of color country is that the history of our country says that attitudinal shifts lag far behind demographic shifts. And even past that day when statistically we are majority people of color, the reality is that there will still be a center of gravity culturally and politically in this country that thinks of American identity as synonymous with whiteness, that thinks of the idea of America as synonymous with whiteness. And I think it was about 50 years ago as well that James Baldwin wrote, either presciently or foolishly uh, early, that America is white no longer, and it will never be white again. He wrote that in the 1960s. And on a certain level, he was right, because a tide had already been unleashed, not only of the civil rights movement, but of this wider sense in which people of every color and creed were finding it possible, indeed absolutely necessary, to claim the American idea, to claim the American creed, and to say, we are as American as anybody else. While that work continues, this basic question of who is us is still one that is answered too often in the narrowest possible terms. And so one of our jobs here, as we gather for the centennial meeting, is to equip ourselves with the capacity to have and to hold wider, better, more inclusive, more capacious conversations about this notion of who is us now. Which brings me to this second question. What is liberal education for? Here, too, there's a little bit of cause, as I think we all know, and indeed it's partly why we all come together in a conference like this. There's some cause for concern. It's not just that technology is disrupting higher education left and right. It's not just that state legislatures around the country are wondering why they are investing or should be investing in higher education. It's not just that the same kind of data-driven analytics that are remaking every field, sports, business, consumption of culture, are forcing a remaking of education. And it's not just that all of these trends put together are 
upsetting all of our inherited notions of the purposes of liberal education. It's also that we gather today at a time when, paradoxically, the world looks to American colleges and universities as the very paragon of what is possible, the very paragon of open-hearted, open-minded liberal education, the very paragon of training people to be curious, engaged, participating problem solvers in the work of the world. And yet at that very moment that the rest of the world sees us as the paragon, we ourselves in our country have a bit of a crisis of confidence. We ourselves are wondering, will our institutions be here? Not just in 100 years, but heck, in 10 years, in 15 years. Will our jobs be here? Will the ways that our work unfolds still exist? What is liberal education for? AAC and you, of course, does nothing but answer that question in all of its work and all of its products. But one of the things that I think we've all got to do is learn how to translate that work to wider audiences and translate the ideas and the arguments of why liberal education matters. Matters, yes, for career, but matters also for country, for citizenship. One of my heroes, Supreme, retired Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who, as many of you know, in her retirement from the court, has been running a nonprofit called iCivics.org, which creates an online platform mainly of games for middle school students to play video games that teach different aspects of civics. And she's doing this and she's trying this not only to be up to date and creative and innovative in the ways that she goes about teaching civics, but she does this also to remind every audience she speaks to, whether they are children or whether they are administrators and professors and leaders from some of the great institutions of our land, that the very purpose of free compulsory public education in this country was to make citizens. And yet that core animating purpose has receded to the margins of what goes on in our K-12 education system. And I would say too often it recedes to the margins as well of our higher, educa higher education system as well. Liberal education is for many things, but let us not forget at its base, liberal education, particularly in this country, is to make citizens. Every college, I don't care whether you are a technical college, whether you are a college of the arts, whether you are a college known for its medical research, whether you are a college known for its literature and history, every college and university is a college of democracy, teaching its students how to participate, how to claim ownership of problems, how to assert responsibility. The liberal in liberal education, of course, is connected to the very idea of liberty. And the very idea of liberty is not is not merely, in fact, is not at all the simple removal of encumbrance. Liberty is not don't tread on me. Liberty properly understood is responsibility. Liberty properly understood is how shall I take ownership of the ways of, in which this country fails still to live up to its stated creed? How shall I take ownership of the ways in which this country still contributes to deep problems around the planet? How shall I take ownership of the ways in which this country still does not make equal opportunity a reality for every member of the community? Responsibility is at the heart of liberty, and liberty is at the heart of liberal education. We are here to make citizens. And I want to make something very clear. When I say citizens, I'm not talking about documentation status under the immigration and naturalization laws of the United States. I'm talking about membership in the community. I'm talking about showing up for this country. And as we all know, and there may be people in this room, there are certainly people in every one of our campuses who know this, that there are plenty of people in this country who have the documents but don't live like citizens, and plenty of people who don't have the documents but do. And so for me, it's about the values, the ethics, the commitment to knowledge, and the cultivation of skills of self-government that makes somebody, in this sense, a citizen. That's what we're here for. That's what liberal education is about. And that is what is under 
as great a threat, I think, as we've seen in our lifetimes. The threat is not just the threat of these technological disruptions I've described. The threat is more a threat of what you might think of as market imperialism. If in the first instance, answering the question, who is us, we're worried about a virus of identity fundamentalism, here we've got to worry about a virus of market fundamentalism. The idea that everything can and should be understood through the lens and the language of market valuations, that we should live under the tyranny of the market measurable. That mindset seeps insidiously into every institution of American life, and ours, our institutions are not immune. Again, that is not to say that career doesn't matter. Of course career matters. That is not to say that there isn't a strong and robust economic case for liberal education. Of course there is. It is to say that part of what we have to stand for as well as full, complete humans is the idea that not everything that matters can be understood in the logic of a market. That is what liberal education is for. Well, this brings me finally to this third question, which may seem, the answer to which may seem obvious to you or maybe just simply worrisome, and that is, is democracy done? Is democracy done? And you might think, well, that's kind of a funny question to ask. I mean, here we are gathered in the nation's capital just a couple days after the State of the Union and lots of stuff going on and coming off of elections and, you know, the machinery of our government and our politics seems to be, you know, more or less operating. Democracy's not done. I mean it in this sense. I mean both in the wider global context and just looking at the way we actually do democracy. In the wider global context, you see the emergence of models. Again, I'm most mindful as a Chinese-American of the emergence of the Chinese model, of the way in which China over this last decade plus has risen not only as an economic powerhouse, but as this example to some that it is possible both to deliver economic results for your people and to be a completely illiberal society. This example that says that you can both have economic prosperity and deny basic human rights. This example that says you can be a global geopolitical, diplomatic, and foreign policy and military powerhouse and not pay any particular heed to liberty or democracy. I think some of you know quite well that uh, in recent months, some of the operating organs of the Communist Party of China and the ruling government right now issued some directives that described a set of ideas literally as toxic, as foreign toxic ideas. You know what one of those ideas was? Academic freedom. Right? As a toxic idea, as some kind of Trojan horse, as a secret part of a Western conspiracy to undermine Chinese culture and society. There are lots of people around this world thinking, hey, maybe democracy's done. Maybe you don't need the messiness, the inefficiency, the convolutions, the gridlock of democracy, particularly as it's embodied in the United States, in order to have a successful, prosperous society that delivers for its people. Then you look at places like Russia. Now, Russia's not particularly successful economically, but that is a society, too, that is asserting a model for how to run, how to be a global powerhouse, and how not to even bother to give lip service to democracy. One of the other anniversaries I'm quite conscious of is that we are in the midst also of some 75th anniversaries of some key parts of the Second World War. Last summer, I went to Normandy for the 75th anniversary of the Allied invasion on D-Day. And 
I had been involved 25 years prior to that when I was working for President Clinton for the 50th anniversary. And just to think about the ways in which the world had changed between the 50th in 1994 and the 70th anniversary in 2014 was to recognize, yes, many forms of progress, of course, the unification of Germany, the integration of so many parts of Europe, but it was also to recognize the ways in which some of these old viruses were coming back, some of the old hatreds, some of the old nationalism, some of the old forms of anti-Semitism, some of the very things that not only gave rise to the Second World War, but we have to remember, in the decade before the Second World War, when America was crippled during the Depression, when our country seemed utterly unable to reckon with these large forces, people asked then also, is democracy done? People back then looked at the rather efficient and effective states of Germany and Italy and thought about the appeal of dictatorship and the appeal of effective illiberal governance. Well, we're in a little bit of that kind of moment right now. And that's partly not only because of China's rise and the emergence of other models around the world, but it's partly because, in fact, centrally because we aren't doing a very good job here at home. We're not actually delivering remotely fully on the promise of our democracy. You can measure that a hundred different ways. You can measure that in the now kind of commonplace, you know, we cheer if maybe 5.5 or 6 out of every 10 eligible voters votes, thinking that that is success. That's not success. 50 years after the Voting Rights Act, that is not success. One of my other great heroes who I got to meet last summer, John Lewis. John Lewis didn't stand and try to march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. He didn't get his head bashed in multiple times as a freedom rider. He didn't stand up as a 17-year-old and enlist in the cause of civil rights just so that today, six on a good election cycle, six out of every ten of us might vote. The sacredness of the vote that John Lewis speaks of is something that all of us have profaned. And now, everybody in this room, I'm sure voter turnout in this room is something like 99%. And you might think, well, gosh, it's not my problem. You know, it's the other people who are not voting. But here's the thing. In an ecosystem, in a garden, in this garden of our democracy, in which everything is contagious, in which all of our behaviors, our actions, and our omissions influence each other, there is no such thing as someone else's problem. There is no such thing as, well, I vote and someone else didn't vote, and they've got to deal with that. Indeed, for those young people, some of whom you spend time with on your campus, who are so cynical and disillusioned about politics that they say that they don't want to vote at all, I would add the message, there is no such thing as not voting. There is no such thing as not voting. Not voting is voting. It is voting actively to hand power over to those whose interests and agenda are inimical to your own. Not voting is voting for the status quo. Not voting is voting for a system that systematically disenfranchises those who do not have the money to be heard. And that is the other deep ailment of our democracy today, that it too has been marketized, that speech has been commoditized, and that campaigns are simply battles of ATMs. We're not doing a great job of democracy right now. And so the question of whether it is done is not some merely provocative academic question that I pose. It is a real question. And you can look at all of these questions that I've posed here. Who is us now? What is liberal education for? Is democracy done? You can look at them all as cause for pessimism or concern or a sense that maybe America's best days are behind it. But I don't. I actually look at those three questions and I see them as I see this centennial for this organization as an incredible opportunity. I see these three questions as perhaps one of the best moments, yes, a crucible moment, 
that an institution like this and a group of people like us have had in a really long time because I think the key, the interlocking key to the proper, healthy, pro-social answer to each one of those three questions has to do with the thing that AACNU is centrally about, and that is citizenship. Who is us now? The way that we hold together in these centrifugal times a core unifying sense of American identity is to remember and to restore people's belief in the idea that there is a creed, a civic creed. I might even call it a civic religion in this country that, yes, we continue to fail to live up to, but also, yes, sits there standing in judgment and demanding that we do better every day, every generation. That is a remarkable inheritance. It's a remarkable opportunity if we see it as such to revive a belief in the centrality of these American ideas and the ways that it is exceptional, indeed exceptional, that this country is dedicated to a proposition. That is not to be casually moved by and overlooked. That is core to the idea of American identity. Who is us? I think about that possibility, and it's not just about the constitutional creed. It is also about the hybridity of our cultural operating system, the fact that this country uniquely brings together, well, brings together people like us and our forebears. When I have been speaking about the rise of China and the shadow that it casts not only on American aspiration but also on the identities and loyalties of Chinese Americans, sometimes I'm asked, well, gosh, aren't you scared as an American that sometime soon, maybe in a few years, five years, ten years, China is going to surpass the United States. China's GDP is going to be number one, right? If at current course and speed, that's going to happen maybe in 2017, 2019, 2021. People have different estimates, but on current trajectory, that's going to happen when China becomes number one. And I say, I'm not worried about that at all. I'm not worried about that in the least. Yes, for some people, that's going to be something of a psychological blow, right? You can no longer say that America is economically number one. It doesn't matter. Because even when that day comes, the United States will retain this deep and enduring competitive advantage, which I, I boil down simply this way. America makes Chinese Americans. China does not make American Chinese. China does not take Americans or, for that matter, Germans or Russians or Italians or Brazilians or people from any other part of the planet, does not take them, does not welcome them, does not integrate them, does not empower them, not only to participate in economy, but also in politics, and does not invite them to redefine the very base notion of Chineseness. That is not, that is decidedly not what is going on in China. I just, out of curiosity this summer, asked a, did a thought experiment. I asked, what would it take for me to become Chinese? Literally, what would it take? If I wanted to renounce my citizenship of the United States and say, you know what, I'm pulling up stakes. I, I, I've had it with this place. Uh, I'm going back to the homeland. I want to be Chinese. And so I called the Chinese consulate. <laughs> hoping to, you know, have somebody guide me on what's the process. Like, you have a process here. Uh, I never even got to a live human being. <laughs> because there is no option on the voicemail grid at the Chinese consulate in San Francisco for, hi, I'm from somewhere else and I'd like to come and emigrate to China and naturalize as a citizen of the People's Republic of China. In their most recent census in a country of 1.3 billion, they counted something like 921 naturalized citizens. And I bet most of those were people left over from the uh, Hong Kong handover who were ethnic Chinese and rushing to claim their citizenship status. And so it's not in their operating system. It's not, they're not set up for it legally. They're not set up for it culturally. They're not set up for it ethically. But that is our system. That is the very point and purpose of our system. And when I say this is a competitive advantage that the United States holds, I should add one caveat. If we don't blow it. If we don't blow it. Right? 
And here, too, you realize all the ways in which we can blow it, in which we are blowing it. We blow it by nativism. We blow it by immigration restrictionism. We blow it by a kind of, again, obsession with purity that wants to shut us out from the rest of the world, that wants to erect walls, literal and figurative, that does not see the incredible diversity of human talent that floods into our country and that exists already in our land as untapped asset and unfulfilled potential. That part of American identity makes me incredibly optimistic and incredibly excited. And that is a part of claiming citizenship that has not only, that is not particularly about the Constitution or the creed or the functional aspects of citizenship and voting and so forth. It is about claiming America. And this is a great moment for us all in new ways, with new eyes and new language to claim America. Citizenship is equally central to this idea of what is liberal education for, as I've said. It is for making citizens. And then citizenship as well is core, finally, to this idea of is democracy done. We are gathered here not only in this period of demographic flux, but in an age of nearly unprecedented inequality in the United States. I think... Sometimes the, t- the statistics numb us. We can't fully appreciate the ways in which people talk about the 1% or even the one-tenth of 1% and the proportion of wealth and income that those slivers of the American populace have relative to the rest of us. But I think there have been really interesting studies done by some of your institutions in recent years that show the ways in which this economic inequality sets in motion a vicious cycle. That economic inequality begets political inequality, which then begets more economic inequality, which then begets more political inequality. And that already today, your chances of influencing public policy at the national level, of influencing the actions of Congress, if you are just in the median income, if you're just at the 50th percentile of income, your chances are effectively nil. If you are poor in America, if you are just trying to scrape by on minimum wage, you have, you you literally, as far as the national political system is concerned, may not exist. Our politics is responsive to that tiny sliver. Our politics is responsive to a tiny few. And the only remedy for this actually is not a fix of legislation. The remedy is not, much as I might like to see it, a repeal of Citizens United. The the remedy precedes all of these things. The remedy is citizens actually believing that we can change this. The remedy is citizens actually believing that we must change this. The remedy is a remedy of faith, a remedy of mindset, a remedy of belief, a remedy of, again, what I think of as civic religion, a belief that there is a creed to be redeemed that is being undermined today. And to me, again, what gives me cause for optimism rather than pessimism is that when you get outside of this town that we're in right now and you go back to the towns that all of us are from, it's happening. We are in an age of incredible civic ferment at the local level. We are in an age of what I call networked localism, where civic activists in different cities are now linking up, partly through technology and partly just because they're realizing that their challenges are similar, that what Cleveland and the Bronx and San Diego and Seattle face in trying to make housing affordable, in trying to raise the wage, in trying to deal with gun responsibility, and all of these different issues that these cities have a lot in common, and that they have strategies and plays and ideas to share with one another, and that, in a sense, this networking of local citizen power bypasses altogether the brokenness of our national politics. It's an incredible age of civic ferment. In Seattle, where I'm from, this is happening on issue after issue. 
I was part of the group that, of citizens who put the idea of a $15 minimum wage on the agenda. And that, thank you. <laughs> and then part of the task force that actually struck the compromise deal between business and labor and other interests in the community that has made Seattle the first city in the country to get to 15. But that wasn't just about me and a few leaders. That was about a whole wave of people who hadn't previously been involved in civic life, who hadn't ever shown up for civics or politics, who'd never given a public speech before. Some of them were educated. Some of them were low-wage workers. There were baggage handlers and academics. There were activists and restaurant workers, all coming together to say, you know what? We can do something, and we've got to do something. On issue after issue in this country, citizenship is facing an incredible revival at the local level. And this, too, is an opportunity for every member institution of AAC and you. Because while our work and while our gathering today is national in spirit, when you go back home, you are on a campus. And when you are on that campus, you are connected to a community. And that town that is connected to your gown is one of the greatest arenas in existence for the practice of powerful citizenship. It is one of the greatest classrooms you will find for how people can become literate in power, understanding what civic power is, who has it, who does not have it, why that is, why it is allocated the way it is, and how it can be exercised anew. And so I think this is an incredible moment of opportunity. When we think about our responsibility now, when we think about what we've got to do in this age, I think this is the work of the next century. This is the work. I, I liked how Ken said that uh, some of our scholars who were honored here today are going to be standing on this podium at 2115. And, uh, you know, th that is faith. That is faith not only in the idea that higher education will exist in 2115. It's faith in science that it will extend lifespans <laughs> to a century and a half. But it's faith also in the idea that every one of us, every day, is passing something on to the next generation. That every one of us, every day, is trying to live a set of ideals that will not die when we die. That every one of us, every day, is literally a trustee. Not only in the sense of being members of governing boards of colleges and universities, but a trustee, a steward of our democracy. And so we've got to commit ourselves over this next century so that when these young folks are on this podium in 2115, they will be able to say with great satisfaction that we took it upon ourselves starting today to teach our students, to teach each other, teach our peers, our family, and our fellow citizens how to inoculate ourselves against identity fundamentalism, against market fundamentalism. That we, starting today, committed to teaching people in new ways how to claim citizen voice and citizen power, how to exercise that muscle, and how to apply that kind of learning that is liberal education at its finest in the gritty and often messy arenas of policymaking in the places where we live. And that we committed here today, gathering at the centennial, to doing all of the work that is necessary, spiritual as well as academic, in heart as well as in mind, to renew the spirit of American democracy. If we do that, we will have earned our keep. If we would do that, we will have made it possible for us not only to say optimistically on the cover of a report that this is a crucible moment. We will have made it possible for this organization and for this country to recognize the ways in which we came through that crucible stronger, better, more unified, more purposeful, more capacious, more powerful, and more full of belief 
in the mission and the spirit of American identity and American citizenship than this organization had ever been in its first 100 years. I know we can do it, and I know we will. Thank you very much. We have extraordinary colleagues, uh, and what else could there possibly be to say? <laughs> but there is more. I want to join uh, Ken and, and Mark and Eric in welcoming you to our centennial and to our embrace of the work of the next century. Uh, and so in the next few minutes, I'm going to be talking with you very briefly about what we've accomplished recently, but looking forward in exactly the spirit that Eric has outlined for us, how do we have actually fulfill the promise of liberal education as one of the core pillars of a free society and of a globally responsible democracy? How do we fulfill that promise? How do we take the imperative that's been handed to us and prepare our students to actually take ownership of their place in creating solutions for America's future? America's economic future, America's democratic future, America's global future. How do we do that? Now, those of you who know me, and, and how many of you are just coming to this meeting for the first time? How many of you have never been here before? Okay, so uh, it's a mix of, of new and old. You, those of you who know me know I go nowhere without a text. Uh, and so you have received on your uh, seats the text, the backdrop for this um, second part of our opening centennial plenary. It is called the Leap Challenge. I'm going to try to set a context for it. I'm going to create an opportunity for students to speak to it. And I'm going to invite all of you to take ownership of the LEAP Challenge and our shared responsibility of preparing students who, in all the ways that Eric has so brilliantly outlined, see it as their work, their life's task, to make a success of our union and our, and our community with global partners around the world. So it's a joy, obviously, to be here for this centennial and a, a huge honor to be the person who presides over uh, that arbitrarily de decreed date, neither 99 nor 101, but uh, the moment, and in fact, the year in which we take stock of where we've been and where we want to go. Uh, we see this annual meeting, we see this session as the beginning of a year of dialogue about the relationship between liberal education on the one hand any possible concept of flourishing, whether local or global, on the, other, on the same hand, and the equity imperative, taking seriously the fact that the most powerful forms of learning are not yet the birthright of all our citizens, and that even within higher education, there are deep divides among us. So we are launching a year of, of debate and dialogue with all of you about what it means to connect liberal education with the equity imperative, uh, and the centerpiece of that is what we are calling the LEAP Challenge. Now, as Eric has reminded us, uh, one of the core goals of liberal education, foundational tenets, is that it's, so it's necessary for democracy to make citizens, to educate citizens, to prepare people who have the habits of mind, the inclinations of heart, and the willingness uh, to take their place in the public square, to see it as their work to help solve our problems. There was a time when public figures talked about this routinely, and if you go back through the pages of AAC and U AAC early meetings, see what our members were saying at the founding, see what they were saying in the 40s, see what they were saying in the 60s, see what our public figures, the Truman Commission report of 1947, what was it saying about the principal goals for higher education, the same report that launched the community college movement in the United States, principal goals. The, full, the fuller realization of democracy in every sphere of life, the building of international cooperation and understanding, an education for the application of creative imagination and trained intelligence to the solution of social problems and to the administration of public affairs. 1947. It has been a very long time since you have heard public figures stand up and say from the nation's capital that these were the purposes of higher education. 
There has been an incredible narrowing of the public discourse about what education is for. You live in the midst of it. Your students come to your campuses. Not having heard the college has anything to do with democracy or global problem solving. They understand, and rightly so, that it will prepare them for a complex economy, but that is all they understand. So it is our challenge and our responsibility to reposition the multiple goals of a 21st century education before our students, before our communities, before our society, and before the world. That, in a nutshell, really is what the LEAP Challenge is about, articulating why liberal education matters, how it creates new capital for our society, and then living up to the promise, fulfilling the promise. Now, AACNU, as you know, has not just begun this work. We have spent the last two decades under my predecessors, John Chandler, who is here this morning, and Paula Brownlee, who is also here this morning, and with, in partnership with all of you, inspired and led by all of you, we have articulated a framework for 21st century liberal education that takes seriously the multiple goals. We are preparing students for a complex, volatile economy, yes, but we are also preparing them for democratic responsibility, for global engagement, and to flourish in their own lives. We've reclaimed the notion in partnership with Bringing Theory to Practice, a partner association working with us, uh, that we are educating people, human beings, citizens. This, is what, this was said in 1915 when we were founded. Remember that you are educating persons, not teaching subjects. Uh, and we are saying it today. We are preparing individuals for the work of community. That is the essence of a liberal education. If you have not um, actually seen or memorized the vision for liberal education that we have articulated together through LEAP, uh, you'll find it on page nine of the LEAP Challenge. Uh, it's all spelled out there. We want a liberal education to provide broad knowledge of science, society, culture, history, and democratic values. We want a liberal education to develop the, the habits of mind and practical skills, critical inquiry, problem solving, collaboration, learning from diverse partners that we need to put that knowledge to wise use. We foregrounded the notion that we are educating people for personal and social responsibility, and we have emphasized what we call the 21st century liberal art, which is, which is that students are actually supposed to integrate and apply this learning to real problems, to real questions. The goal of a liberal education is not to get students through the right number of courses in the right categories with timely uh, accumulation of credit hours. The goal of a liberal education is to build these capacities through guided practice, the guided practice that faculty and educational leaders together provide in community for us to build these capacities that we need to put the knowledge to use in responsible ways as citizens as human beings, as thoughtful people. That's the 21st century liberal art to actually apply the learning. Now, we've come a long way through the LEAP initiative. There is broad embrace across higher education of all the different pieces and parts of this perspective. Those of you who were here yesterday heard Jamie Marisotis from the Lumina Foundation talk about the testing of 400 campuses of the degree qualifications profile it was tested and, and found useful but need, in need of improvement in the first um, four years of experimentation on campus. The changes people wanted to make in the degree, degree qualifications profile made it not just a kissing cousin of the LEAP Vision for Learning, they made it a twin sister of the LEAP Vision for Learning. Uh, we, in effect, had a kind of vote of the community. We want students who are ethically prepared. We want students who are globally prepared. We want students to be able to apply their learning. There has been a broad testing of these ideas across higher education and an embrace of them under many different names. In the last decade, AACNU has become the only national organization that is routinely appealed to when we actually talk about quality. What is it we mean by quality? How do we get there? And sooner, later if not always sooner, people come to recognize that the essential learning outcomes are the benchmarks for quality learning in the 21st century. We have routinely, uh, over five years, or over 10 years, produced five surveys that have shown again and again, this is what employers want. When employers are talking about how hard it is to find, they use the term skills, not liberal education outcomes, uh, but when, how hard it is to find the skills they need for a fast-changing economy and enterprise, 
uh, they are talking about the outcomes of a liberal, liberal education. In the survey that we just released on Tuesday, I hope you've seen it, uh, we see that students are hearing it too. Ten years ago when we launched LEAP, students could not articulate the goals of a 21st century education. They thought their, their job in college was to find the right major, preferably with a name that sounded like a job. Uh, and I'm quoting one student um, who heard me out, and he said, I'm very concerned about what Dr. Schneider has to say. I always thought that if I just did whatever I needed to do in my major, that I'd be able to get whatever job I wanted when I was done. And now she's telling me that employers are looking for critical thinking and problem solving and ethical reasoning and civic knowledge. <laughs> this is news, the student said, <laughs> to my consternation, and I believe that of the faculty who had brought him to our conference. Um, but in the survey that uh, we released on Tuesday, we saw that students have heard the message that it takes more than a major, that it takes this broad array of, of learning outcomes to be well prepared for the economy. Uh, and we see that students are actually more intense in their commitment to building capacity for democracy, for diversity, for global engagement than employers seem to be. So our students are indeed our hope for the future. But it is also the case, we know this, that too many students are not leaving college with the kind of learning that we talk about, that we have embraced as a community, that, this, that represents our hallmarks, our investment in quality. We know that we have a shared vision. We know that our actual performance is deeply uneven. And that is the context in which we are bringing before you, as the work of our second century, uh, a commitment to the LEAP Challenge, ensuring that all college students are actually leaving, not just with degrees, not just with credentials, but with a portfolio that represents the kind of accomplishment LEAP is talking about. Now, if you know ASC and you at all, you know that we don't think these things up by ourselves. We watch you. There is nothing we are recommending in the LEAP Challenge that is not already happening on many of your campuses. M many of the exemplars will be discussed in the various sessions uh, over the next three days. Um, so we are inspired by your leadership, but it is our task to try to hold up a mirror to you and to say, this is where we need to be going. This is where you're saying we need to be going. How can we collectively join forces uh, to, to get there? We are also looking at the evidence on what actually look, works for students. And as I talk about the LEAP Challenge, you will know that it is evidence-based, that there is abundant evidence that more practice in the kind of things I'm going to talk about will be better both for student learning and for student completion. It's a, it's a double win. Uh, but most of all, we've been inspired by what we're about to recommend by actually listening to students. Their voices have been fundamental in our embrace of a new a next iteration of the LEAP work, what we call the LEAP Challenge. And so now I want to, as part of our centennial, engage you in listening with us to the voices of students at institutions around the country, answering the question, what were the most empowering forms of learning for you at this institution that you were attending? How did college make a difference for you? Uh, this centennial uh, video has been made possible by a very generous gift from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I think I'm supposed to say that they don't necessarily embrace everything it says, but I think they actually do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it has been made for us by Paul Stern of Vox Television. Is Paul here? I can't see your hand. I believe he is here, and we will all want to thank him. Uh, and now if we can begin the video, I want to engage you in hearing the voices of our students and of other educational leaders across the country. As a high school student, and I had no clue you know, what I wanted to do with college, and I never considered the possibility of becoming a, a PhD in chemistry. I am Jose Zavala. I am a fifth year student at California State University Fullerton, and I'm studying biochemistry. So I took a variety of courses to try to find what I was interested in. Eventually, I decided I really liked biochemistry. I started at Mount San Antonio College, a community college nearby. I'm very hands-on. I like to do things while I'm learning. That really helps me on a deeper level understand what it is that's happening. 
As we mark our centennial, AACNU is really looking to the future. And we are trying to launch a new generation of the LEAP initiative that will enable us to ensure every single student gets the benefits of experiential, problem-based, public-spirited liberal education that will help them succeed in the future. So this previous summer, I was actually at a research experience for undergraduates at Texas A&M University. I became interested in that because of the research that I'm doing here at Cal State Fullerton. I love my campus, but we don't have access to things like uh, atomic force microscopy, which they did have out there in Texas. It really shows you that your perspective of the world is based on your, your physical um, existence. Let's work on exercise that we're doing. Let's come up with like a good, like, good problem. The issue of preparing problem solvers for our future is really critical. What does it look like it is right now? The educational goals of LEAP, or Liberal Education in America's Promise, are really specifying the kinds of competencies that we want all college graduates to possess when they finish. The ability to problem solve, to think critically, to think creatively, to communicate, to be culturally competent, and work in a team. Things that will carry graduates into the future, no matter what that future is. The way to do that is to have active learning environments where students have a very active experiential learning. Companies more and more are not interested in skills and knowledge, they're interested in lifelong learners that can grow with their companies, with the economy. And will help us solve problems in our society, be able to work in a global environment, no matter what the discipline, no matter what the major. We're also talking about inclusive excellence. We are a minority serving institution. We have a large number of students and many of them are first generation. And we talk about cultivating talent. We want those students to have those same kinds of opportunities for excellence and learning. Now that strikes a little chord with me because uh, growing up, I'm a student of uh, Mexican descendants. So my parents, I love them with all my heart, but they had a totally different world that they lived through. So they actually um, didn't know how to support me going through college. It wasn't, of course, until now that I realized that I could be something that my parents um, didn't know how to do. My name is Abby Daniel. I'm a senior at the College of Worcester. I'm studying biochemistry and molecular biology. I'm looking at how soil bacterium breaks down a certain chemical. The nicotinic acid or vitamin B3 has a really similar chemical structure as a lot of toxic environmental contaminants. The idea is that by studying how it breaks down, we might be able to better understand how these toxic chemicals break down so that we can do environmental remediation. The College of Worcester is a traditional residential liberal arts college. We have a particular take on liberal education, which is focused around developing our students' capacity for research for not just consuming knowledge, but being producers of new knowledge. Every single student completes a year-long mentored research project. So the faculty has to take everybody who comes into a first-year class and make sure that they all have an equal access opportunity to work towards doing independent research in their senior year. It's an intellectual egalitarianism. In the PCR gel, it's 583 base pairs, so about 0.5. Each student creates a substantial thesis, a written document, that shows the results of their year or more of study. And even though that's the tangible project, we tend to emphasize on the process that it took to get there. 
Which of these bands tells you you've got the gene? But that process itself allows the student to take risks and ask the questions that no one has asked before. One of the things we know from the LEAP research is that mentored undergraduate research is a high-impact practice. It's one of those ways of going about liberal education that makes a transformative difference in students' lives. There's so much self-discovery that happens in this type of education. And when a person, I think, is given the time and the space and the help and the support to do that self-discovery, they're really going to find something that they are going to be willing and happy and energetic and passionate to spend their life devoted to. My name is Jenny Perez. I'm 20 years old. I was born in the Dominican Republic, and I came here when I was nine years old. I didn't know any English at all, or anything, not even saying hi or bye. <laughs> it takes me like two hours trip every day. And it's worth it, because everything that I have learned here at LaGuardia, it's just worth coming. Our students come to us from about 160 different countries. They speak about 110 different languages. About half of the student body was not born in the United States. We really sit at the crux of the new American immigrant population and really hope to move forward and serve a new America. I have this wonderful internship in Harlem Hospital. I'm in the OBGYN department as a patient coordinator. Students need to have a comprehensive education that really exposes them to all the modes of thinking that are endemic to what should happen in a modern world. Looking at the broad sweep of our data, we're increasingly convinced that a liberal education that takes place in the classroom and beyond is the key to helping students succeed. Good morning, everybody. Today, we'll be working on career goals and educational goals. I'm a student success mentor here at LaGuardia, and I help other students create their e-portfolio. An e-portfolio is an online way to give a sort of sacred space for learning and reflection for these students that follows them throughout their entire trajectory here. It changed my life. I saw myself growing as a person. In my case, I always wanted to be a doctor, but I never really thought about, you know, how, and the ePortfolio forces you to do that, to think about the step-by-step -step process. It's like a journal for you. You learn about yourself, you learn about how you learn, and that is pretty amazing. If we do not embed in our curriculum and our structures the ability to have broad thinkers, we are reifying the inequity in our culture instead of changing it. So I think it's essential, particularly for me as a community college president and a community college advocate, to say these high-minded ideals, if you will, are not high-minded. They're relentlessly practical. They're absolutely what needs to happen. We cannot allow sectors of higher education to be segregated into those that do limited technical education and those that do broader liberal education. We have to marry those two. I really want to see what else I can be good at in this world, not just one thing.
I'm Athena Casarado. All right, should we cut a circle out of it or just keep the uh, square? We're gonna keep it a square. Keep it a square, okay. And I'm a senior at WPI studying mechanical engineering. Perfect. I'm working with two other students and an advisor in a lab on campus to test out ice cream and learn about its viscoelastic properties. This is this a good one? Will it get too cold? Will it be too crystallized when it comes to your home freezer? Knowing the viscoelasticity in particular about ice cream is useful for food engineers wanting to know the best way to manufacture it and to ship it and to um, package it. The senior year projects that most of our students do in their major actually come from companies. Our students are working with the employers from the time that they're here, learning to solve problems that the employers really care about. WPI was founded on the concept of theory and practice together. Our students are trained in real-world skills by executing projects that generate creative thinking and ethical action and uh, an impact in the world. My interactive qualifying project, I was in Bangkok, Thailand for two months at the site of the Rayong oil spill. We wanted to see how the economy was impacted, how socially they were affected by the oil spill. The biggest challenge was overcoming the cultural differences. Americans can be more forward and direct. Thai people tend to be more indirect and reserved with their opinions. And so overcoming that kind of communication barrier took a while, but in the end we were able to feel more comfortable with each other. And then we produced a list of recommendations for Thailand to better respond to oil spills in the future. The essence of our curriculum is providing students with the opportunity to solve authentic, real-world problems. Those real-world problems are inevitably messy and interdisciplinary. They involve technology, but they also involve people. We found that giving students the opportunity and the responsibility to tackle those types of problems while they're students is enormously powerful and can be a transformative experience. I've done everything from wind turbines to ice cream and oil spills, and I've interned at helicopter companies and healthcare software companies. I can work on teams, I can study anything you want to throw at me. I am excited by new topics, new ideas, new projects and any student who attends a product-based institution will have this opportunity to learn about themselves and to learn about others and to learn about the world. I'd known most of my life that I wanted to be an attorney. And then when I came to Michigan State, I had a professor sit me down and say, Joe, you're amazing. Don't just settle on law school, you can do more. And had I just been pre-locked, I would have never went to Madagascar. Madagascar is the largest biodiversity hotspot, but one of the poorest countries in the world. Well, development can happen if we do incorporate the voice of the people of these communities, because they know their communities, they know their environment, they know their people, and their voice and their opinions are equally important in this conversation. That was the experience that made me say, you know what, this is what I want to do. I'm Jalisa Brooks. I'm studying political theory, constitutional democracy at Michigan State University. Michigan State University is the original land-grant institution. We were really created as the template for a new kind of public education in the United States. An institution that would combine both liberal education with the practical education. And it's a mission we don't ever forget, and that we work every day to live out. I feel more comfortable in my skin from seeing the rest of the world, and I know more about myself and my identity. I think that's what education should be. It's not just about gaining knowledge, but when you experience things, it's more tangible, and it feels more real, and it feels more applicable. 
This is not about training people for a job. This is about preparing people for a lifetime of contribution in the workplace, in the community, and their families. I want to dedicate my life to development, um, both domestically and abroad. Not that I'm going to make the world a better place single-handedly, but that we all have a role in making our world a better place. They speak for themselves, they speak for the future, and they inspire the work of this organization and the work that we do together. When I listen to that video, I hear at least four things. I hear the results of an extraordinary degree of institutional intentionality over time. These are institutions that have thought hard about how they can prepare students to bring theory and practice together, to develop those capacities, not just something is, that students can name, <clears throat> but something that students have taken into their DNA by practicing, by applying their learning to real problems. I hear, it's invis it's lo there's a longer version of this, I should mention. Uh, we've just shown you the shortened version of this. In the longer version, faculty members uh, speak more fully. But behind every one of these students are faculty who have themselves help students connect <clears throat> the broad knowledge they're acquiring in college with real problems, problems of the laboratory, problems of the community, problems of the world. I hear, and I hope you all heard, the students talking without the lingo, but about the particulars of what LEAP calls high-impact practices. They were asked, what's important for you? It was research, it was internships, it was the e-portfolio, it was their time abroad, their time working with the community, their time working at, at some institutions a team, in teams. They didn't have the language of high impact practices, but they were telling us what difference those practices make to them. But most of all, and I think this is central to where the LEAP Challenge takes us, they were telling us that they came alive when they became engaged with real problems authentic problems, what AACNU has called unscripted problems. And that's, I believe, the future of liberal education. Not to move students through courses in which they take multiple choice tests and finals. Not to do routinized work, but to build across their experiential learning and their formal learning, their capacity and their preparation to tackle real problems, problems that matter to them, that tap their enthusiasm and energy, problems that matter to us, whether they are problems of the workplace or the community, or the workplace and the community coming together, problems that matter to them in their own lives. And so that brings us to the LEAP Challenge. We are calling on higher education to make it an expectation for every student, every one of them, broad access institution, highly selective, big, small, two-year, four-year, to have experiences while they're in college of working in depth over an extended period of time on a problem that matters to the student and a problem whose significance the student can describe to others. We are calling this signature work. It is the notion that we should be telling students before they ever get to college, you are coming to college not to do gen ed and a major, but to build your capacity and preparation to tackle a significant problem and to take it somewhere. No individual solves problems by themselves, but these students, the ones we just heard from, they are coming to see themselves as people who can work with others to create solutions to all those difficult and intractable issues we face as a society, as a global community, and in the workplace. Those of you who were here yesterday heard employers saying, actually, we describe it as a VUCA world. Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. That's the world of work. Students need exactly the same capacities to succeed in the world of work that they need to contribute to, to creating solutions for our democracy. It's not either or, it comes together. We will release this afternoon a report called America's Unmet Promise, the imperative for equity in higher education. We'll take a look at the small fraction of students who are actually doing this kind of work now. 
depending on which high impact practice you're talking about, there's none where you can say that the majority of our students are doing this kind of thing. And we know from national research and from research we have done in selected states that when you look at the list of 10 high impact practices, the mean for the average student in those states is 1.3 practices. One of those practices across two, four, six, often more years of school. Hardly enough. So the LEAP challenge is calling on us not just to engage students with real questions and with significant work related to those questions, but to take a fresh look at the way we design our educational pathways so that students are engaged from the beginning. As the leaders in this film just said, we start in the first year. We get them asking questions in the first year. We start building their capacity to use these skills. By the second year, we are saying students in sophomore in their sophomore year, students who are finishing community college, they should have an experience of working on a complex question across disciplines. This is the point of a liberal education. Not to get the broad survey courses out of the way first. No. <laughs> I mean, that defeats the entire purpose of our broad multi uh, multidisciplinary education. As our colleague Rick Vaz said in this film, when you work with real world problems, they are by definition multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary. They call for many perspectives. And so we should be braiding our broad education spirally throughout the curriculum, first to final year, connected to the majors, connected to the things that students came to college to develop expertise in. It's not either or. But breaking free of an outdated design for breadth first and depth second, and in effect, bringing a third strand into the curriculum, and that strand is intentional, purposeful, hands-on, applied liberal learning, prepared for, practiced, and finally culminating in what we are calling signature work. We've given you in this LEAP challenge one possible way of thinking about it. There are many ways of thinking about it, as the film showed. We're not saying necessarily research. We're not saying necessarily internship. We're saying figure it out with your students for your community how we get all of them in, involved in this engaged application of liberal learning to complex questions and real problems, problems that matter to the student, that matter to us. So the pathway you have on page five and six of your um, LEAP Challenge folio uh, shows the redesign of general education to integrate with majors. Uh, but to build capacity over time for students to, to identify questions by a, a second year uh, inquiry seminar, to be working on projects related to those questions, and then to continue those inquiries in relation to their majors as they go on, to have identified a question as they become juniors and seniors. This is the thing I care about. One of the things I care about, here's how my courses connect to it. Here's how my high impact practices connect to it. And by the time I'm done, I will have produced my version, the student's version, of signature work, something that mattered to the student enough to spend time on it, something that shows the students that they are capable of making contributions to our future, something that tells us tangibly that the students have, in fact, achieved that preparation as thoughtful individuals, as creative problem solvers, as people who, will, who already have begun to take responsibility for fulfilling the as yet unredeemed promise of full equality, full justice, full democracy in our own community and ultimately around the world. So that's the LEAP challenge, signature work for every student, the word signature chosen to, to make it clear that this is the student putting his or her signature on their cumulative and integrative and applied learning over time. It's bringing a can-do face to liberal education. It's positioning us not just as the world's most admired form of learning, but actually as the preparation that America needs to be a problem-solving society, to do civic problem-solving, to do work-related problem-solving, to do all the problem-solving that we all have to do to fulfill the expectations and hopes we have for our own lives. So uh, we have tried in the next phase of the annual meeting uh, to actually model what we recommend to everyone else, and we brought some degree of intentional design to the second half of this morning. We recognize, or we hope, and we hope you recognize, that taking signature work seriously doesn't just mean adding one more thing to the curriculum as it is. It's calling for a thoughtful redesign of the pathway so that students are prepared, so that they are practicing, so that by the time they're actually doing either their sophomore rehearsal of signature work or their senior accomplishment of it, they are ready and they have taken ownership of their own learning. 
they're not just moving through courses, they are in fact ready to um, make contributions to our own society. So in, all the, in the complete band of sessions that follow this opening annual meeting, you have a way to explore further what this might mean for your institution, your mission, your students, your work. Across its centennial year, uh, starting uh, about 12 months ago, AAC and you began active fundraising to enable us to work with you as we move forward the LEAP Challenge as a serious centerpiece of liberal education for the 21st century. Uh, we have raised to date close to $13 million. Some of it will be... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it has been a busy year. Um, some of it will be used to support dialogues across the country, including, we hope, dialogues on your campuses by next fall about how we actually move to make this kind of learning both expected and inclusive. This is what we mean by inclusive excellence, empowering learning for every student. So some of the money will be going for dialogues to try to create will building, expanded social networks, as Eric has recommended, uh, that begin to see the college isn't just getting in and getting out with a credential, but in fact, what happens in between is what makes all the difference to the student's future, but to our future. Um, so most of the money will go into a series of projects through which we will work with you on different aspects of the redesigns that are needed uh, to ensure that students are ready, are engaged, are in fact producing work in which they take pride and in which we can take pride. None of these initiatives that I'm about to describe and that constitute the subject matter of the next half of this morning, none of them are new. All of them are works in progress because we got these ideas from watching you, from listening to you. But nonetheless, we do understand that we are really calling for a radical shift in what liberal education is about. I remind you that 1900, the major wasn't there. AAC's opening meeting in 1915, we generated a report on the efficient college and its curriculum. The major was not there. The major is an invention of the period following uh, 1909, 1911. It had been tried out at Johns Hopkins in 1876, but it's only when Harvard and Princeton gave it a big push forward that we all put majors in place. We are suggesting that we needed to put braided pathways, guided pathways into place so that students know that they are supposed to integrate their learning and they are helped to be able to do it. So what are some of the uh, lines of work that we will be engaged in as we go forward? If you look at pages 11 to, and 12 of your program, one piece of it is the institutional piece. There will be a session on what we call the roadmap, actually mapping the institutional pathways, academic affairs, student life, all the student success initiatives working together to create an institutional environment that's hospitable to this kind of work, in which students feel that they belong, feel that they're supported, feel that they're working forward. There will be a session on signature work, uh, and it will be led by institutions, some in this film, but others that should have been in the film, but we couldn't make an hour-long film, uh, who have been doing this kind of thing for all their students for at least 20 years, and in some cases, much longer. Uh, we will be hearing from them, how do you make it work? How do you reward faculty? How do you engage students? How do you actually make this succeed? Uh, many of you work uh, continuous, uh, continuously on the improvement of general education. A big piece of our work on uh, signature work and the, Lem Gems challenge, the LEAP Challenge will go forward in the context of what we call general education maps and models, and there will be a session on what this means for general education. Faculty are crucial in the session called TIDES, uh, Teaching to Increase Diversity and Equity in STEM. We'll be looking at how we prepare students, uh, faculty, how we support them in redesigning courses early in the educational experience, in this case in math intensive fields, so that students stay, so that students have their imaginations kindled, so that they in fact become, can become the STEM professionals that many of them want to be. Uh, we will have a session on what we call Liberal Education Unbound, I am extremely mindful, as I put all of this before you, that we are in a digital revolution. And it is our collective challenge to seize that revolution and make it work for the kind of learning we're talking about. And that will be the, the subject matter of liberal education unbound. How do we get deeper liberal learning in a digital virtual uh, environment? How do we get more high impact practice uh, in the new ecology of digitally informed and strengthened liberal education? Uh, we've said 
repeatedly, and I say again, you heard it in this film, we are talking about educating students individ as individuals. What does it mean to actually take seriously the students' own flourishing and well-being? That will be the subject of a session led by our partner organization, Bringing Theory to Practice. Uh, and then uh, last in the sequence, but certainly not least, how does assessment play in all this? Our conviction as an association is that the kind of work students are doing, that we call signature work, should be the centerpiece of what we look at and assess to see whether or not they are making the progress that we hope they are making, that we intend them to make, that we have formed our communities to help them make. So the value session will be talking about that. And then I want to call your attention to a session on Friday afternoon where we will go into another aspect of this. This is led by our STIRS project. How do we actually teach students the arts of systematic thinking and integrative reasoning? These don't, they don't generally arrive with this. What are some of the practices that faculty have already put together to ensure that our students have early opportunities to develop these capacities so that they really are ready for signature work? And then, of course, the rest of the meeting is all about the same thing because, as I said, we got these ideas from you we believe we can do this because of what you are doing. And we look forward, as we go forward into that second century, to learning with and from you as we all create together a new version of liberal education, analytical and applied, public-spirited, practical, that will prepare our students and our communities to create solutions for our future. Thank you very much. Well, Eric and, and Carol, thank you very, very much. I think we feel suitably challenged for the next 100 years, and we have some, uh, some work to do. Please join me in thanking Eric and Carol once more. Thank you.